Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, happy Wednesday. Uh, my name is Rich Capitan. I'm the education director at the Alaska Zoo. Uh, we are here for our Wildlife Wednesday program. Um, I believe this is our second of the season. Um, obviously, the goal would be at some point to do this uh, in person, but we are doing it virtually because it's the way we roll, right? Um, but before we get into our program tonight, I do want to say thank you to our sponsors who have uh, helped us uh, do this for many, many years. Um, the Alaska Zoo has been doing this for a long time. We've been doing Wildlife Wednesdays, I think, for, oh, I don't want to, mm, like, coming up on 20 years or something ridiculous. But uh, a big thanks to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Uh, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service has been a big partner. Uh, NOAA Fisheries. Uh, the National Park Service, uh, Alaska Conservation Foundation, uh, Projects in Motion, and of course, Alaska Geographic as well. So um, a lot of partners uh, uh, help us out to bring this uh, super great program to you uh, in person before and now virtually. Um, I do wanna say, be watching the chat. We have kind of a fun thing tonight, uh, Alaska Geographic has basically uh, donated a gift bag that's full of gifts. Uh, so I will randomly choose a winner uh, uh, looking at the registration tonight uh, and be watching your email for the announcement for who won. Uh, let's see here. Also, uh, I do wanna say Alaska Geographic um, is also offering a 10% 10% discount code uh, on anything in their store. So um, definitely give them uh, a shout out and, and check that out uh, as well. So the reason we're all here tonight is uh, very exciting. We are here for uh, Mr. Drew Hamilton. Uh, I feel like the guy doesn't even need uh, an intro. Um, I know Drew from uh, uh, days at McNeil River. Um, if you've ever been to McNeil, you probably have either seen or heard of Mr. Drew Hamilton. Uh, since McNeil, he's gone on to do other greater bear things. Uh, he's a bear viewing guide. He's now in Churchill, Manitoba, where he's leading uh, bear viewing uh, programs there. And of course, his photography is astounding. Um, but enough about me. Let's turn it over to Mr. Drew Hamilton. Hey, Rich, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and I was thinking back as you're talking about Wildlife Wednesdays, and when I first moved back to Anchorage back in the early 2000s, I do remember going into uh, the library for some world uh, for some Wildlife Wednesday uh, talks. That was I didn't know anybody, so I go to the Wildlife Wednesday, and uh, I always crushed it on the on the door prizes. And so I don't know if I'm eligible tonight or not, but uh, you might want to just pull my name out of contention just because I, I have a tendency to win these things. And I also want to say thank you to the Alaska Zoo. Um, it's always a pleasure and uh, to give a talk for the zoo um, because the zoo did play such an instrumental role in my development as a wildlife lover and a wildlife guide. Uh, here I am uh, on the shores of Hudson Bay looking for polar bears and it does take me back and I often think fondly of the first polar bear I ever saw, which was Binky. Uh, at the Alaska Zoo. And so when I was a kid, uh, we'd always go see Binky. And I liked it, that that played an important role in, in getting me where I am today. Uh, whether it was brown bears by extension or actually sitting here looking for polar bears, I, I credit the Alaska Zoo and I credit Binky uh, tremendously with that. So thank you to the zoo for, for all that you do. Um, so yeah, as you know, I'm in Churchill and I'm in quarantine right now, actually. So, and I'm on a bunch of cold medication and things like that. So, um, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. Uh, every slide is probably going to be a surprise. So I hope you guys enjoy them as much as I do. Uh, we've been going for about a month now. Um, polar bear season is just kind of winding down. And Churchill is, I've been coming here since 2014 and it's always kind of just felt, uh, right to me. It's a, it's a second home in a lot of ways. Um, but I realized that not a lot of people probably know exactly where Churchill is uh, in the greater scheme of things. And I know we're looking for polar bears and it's very cold outside. But when we're looking at the actual map and trying to figure out how far north we are, you'll see Churchill is just under the 
N in Canada, you go, they see it, well, RV it, and then you go down about 200 miles and you're in Churchill, um, which puts us right at about 58 degrees north. And so for those of you that are watching from Anchorage, um, you're actually further north than we are here in, in Churchill. Uh, 58, well, I think Homer is even like 59 degrees north. So Homer, uh, I don't know, we'll call it Churchill's about the same as maybe Katmai or Kodiak or someplace like that. So we're not actually that far north. Um, we're still hundreds of miles from the Arctic Circle, uh, a little closer in on, on Wapusk, or excuse me, on uh, Manitoba. Um, Churchill is going to be in the upper right corner. It's on that kind of east-west ledge. If you see the green outline around Wapusk, uh, Wapusk National Park was established in 1996 to prevent, uh, to protect the, the denning habitat for this uh, Western Hudson Bay polar bear population. So if you've ever seen a picture of a polar bear cub and a tree in the same image, uh, it's from Wapusk. Uh, so Churchill is just west of, of Wapusk National Park and we are in the Western Hudson Bay pop population of polar bears. Um, now, Wapusk is a wild, wild place. And I got these next set of images from a friend of mine who works for the park and they've got a very extensive camera trapping operation. And uh, I was surprised and I think they were surprised too at the diversity of species that were found uh, within the boundaries of this park. Um, this one, I probably should have asked him what it was, uh, but it's a close up. Um, what, they were, what they were looking for really were grizzly bears. Uh, and if you look at the range map for grizzly bears, uh, Churchill is generally not on there, uh, but they have as of late been finding um, all three species of North American bear in Wapusk National Park. There is a grizzly bear for you for sure. Looks like a grizzly bear getting into a snow goose there, maybe a nest, another grizzly bear. So here's a quiz. What's that one? I have no way of knowing your answers. We're just gonna go ahead and tell you, uh, that's a black bear. So it's a little bit of a cinnamon phase uh, black bear going on. Uh, here's a more, uh, more obvious black bear. Uh, so as we see from the photographic evidence, it's kind of this unique little corner where all three species of North American bear overlap in this truly wide place. A lot of times Manitoba gets lumped in with the other prairie provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. But frankly, uh, any place that has black bears, grizzly bears, and polar bears, pretty darn wild. What kind of bear is that? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, it's a wolverine. This place is so wild. <laughs> I've been doing wild stuff for over 20 years and living in field camps and things like that. I've had seven wolverine sightings in 22 years or whatever, and four of them have been here in Churchill. So it is very wild. Uh, caribou migrations come through. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of Alaskans watching this. It definitely has a, a tundra vibe, kind of uh, like a Seward Peninsula feel to it. Uh, some researchers, humans, and of course, yetis. Excuse me, polar bears. This guy cracks me up. He's, he was rubbing on a post or something. His, you can see his tracks coming off the ice there and everything. And his tongue is lolling out to the side as he's scratching, scratching on the poles. Check her out. Mom with cubs. So this is all just right over... Now, so what does make this place a uh, great habitat? Uh, even though we talked about how far, uh, how far north it is, um, if you look at this temperature map showing um, the equivalent, um, find Hudson Bay and over on the west side, we're on that east-west ledge again. And if you follow it over, we're gonna be kind of a Fairbanks, uh, maybe a little north of Fairbanks uh, kind of temperature wise. And one of the things that uh, sets it apart from Fairbanks, it is, it's very cold, like Fairbanks can potentially get, uh, but what really sets it apart is the wind. <laughs> There's not much out here to stop the wind. And I was just thinking before I signed out of this Zoom meeting, um, this was the first time in like four days when I can't hear the wind uh, rattling the siding on the side of my apartment here. Uh, but this is actually what was going on out there right now. These are the conditions that have, have forced the ice onto the shoreline and, and the polar bears going out. Um, so yeah, it, it's very windy here. 
it's also unique in that it's uh, it's where three major ecosystems come together. Uh, so Churchill is just over the A in Manitoba. Uh, again, that east-west shoreline is going to be coming up in a lot of maps, so keep your eye out for that. So you've got uh, the major ecosystems, the tundra to the north, you've got the boreal forest to the south and stretching across the North American continent, and then you've got the marine ecosystem of Hudson Bay. You also have the indigenous peoples who have been associated with these uh, ecosystems for millennia uh, have all come through here at some point. Um, you've got the Inuit to the north, you've got the Dene Athabascan people coming from the west, and then you've got the Cree from the south. You also have a uh, robust and vibrant population, uh, the Métis community, uh, which are people of mixed descent. Uh, so it is a fascinating place culturally, um, ecologically, uh, it's, it should be on everybody's bucket list to come to Churchill just for a visit. Um, then you bring all those things together with the Western history, starting in the, the 1700s, or even earlier with some of the, the explorers, some, some of them didn't fare too well. Henry Hudson himself didn't make it out of this bay alive. Uh, but starting in the early 1700s, the fort, um, uh, over across the river, the Fort Prince of Wales was started, uh, established about 1717. Uh, so when the Hudson Bay Company came into this area, they were, of course, looking for beaver pelts. And um, so they had a kind of unique business model, and they would just set up trading posts at the mouths of the river and let people come to them. And so this was a very effective strategy, considering that the river systems are basically like the early highway system. Um, so you can see this is the drainage for the, the Churchill River. You can basically get all the way from the Rocky Mountains to Churchill uh, by, by boat. Um, and so that's what people would do is they would come here and they would trade their furs and, uh, and then be on their way. It's also accessible by train. And so um, in the late twenties, uh, the farmers in the, the prairie provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba were, were clamoring for new ways to get their, their grain to markets. And so seasonally shipping out of Churchill Obviously, not much shipping goes out of here in the winter, but it is the furthest north deep water port in all of Canada. And so a lot of the grain uh, that comes from the Prairie Provinces will get shipped out of here. In these big, giant ships. It takes, it takes three days to, uh, to load, one of these, uh, load one of these up and they will be heading out to ports unknown once they leave here. Uh, it was a military town. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, there was a lot of military testing that went on here. If you were to go to the war with the Soviets, you needed to know how your tanks were going to work at minus 40. You needed to know what your gun oil was going to do at minus 40. So the U.S. military established a base there. Uh, and then um, later the Can Canadian military took over and they pulled out uh, in the 80s. So, but it, it had up to 5,000 people uh, at some point. Now it's got about 800 people. Uh, so going from this shipping economy in this military town. Um, now it's had to diversify uh, into three distinct um, tourist seasons. Uh, the next one coming up, <laughs> everybody measures time here by polar bear seasons and, and we'll get more into polar bears, I promise. Uh, but we'll start with Aurora season, which is actually one of my favorite times to be here. Uh, I spent so many years in South Central Alaska chasing Aurora. It's really nice to come here for uh, for Aurora season and uh, have it all right out your front door. Now, uh, here in Churchill, uh, though we're further south, um, the Aurora Oval is centered on the magnetic pole. And so that puts Churchill right in the middle of it. And if we were talking Alaska equivalents here, uh, it would be like being in, say, Wiseman. So way up on the Hall Road kind of situation where I think, uh, I think my record was a few years ago, is 20 maybe 18, something like that, maybe 2017, had 21 straight nights of Aurora. And they weren't all rip-roaring shows like Max Block had for his birthday when he was here in Churchill just a few weeks ago, um, which was amazing. I think I have a video of it here next. Um, but it was, it was 21 straight nights of Aurora. It's really nice having that right outside your... Oh, here's that video. Okay, Max, does that look familiar? Remember that one? Isn't that the uh, the show from the spring? No, no, this is your birthday. It is. Sure, huh? sure. <laughs> 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 
call it. This is your one of the two. It looks familiar. One of the two. <laughs> but it's so, it's just so great having this right out, out the front door. Um, we also have the ability to go out and uh, once the polar bears are gone, we will actually go out onto the sea ice and look for Aurora. Um, a couple of our, our more famous landmarks are actually disasters. There was a shipwreck called the MV Ithaca um, that's wedged out in the tidal flats and gets sea ice jammed in around it. And it can be fun to go out there and watch the Aurora. Um, here, here is the Aurora over Hudson Bay. And our other, one of our other landmarks is Miss Piggy, which was a C-46 cargo plane that crashed near the airport <laughs> back in the 70s. Um, and it's a, it's a famous landmark. Right? Everybody knows where Miss Piggy is. So when you're describing where a polar bear might be found, you say, oh, we saw two out on the Miss Piggy Road the other day, uh, or Miss Piggy Beach. Uh, but it is a good place to go watch Aurora uh, as well. And then uh, I really hope to get people with this one because I know people in Alaska love their beluga whales. And I've spent hours and hours and hours watching, looking for beluga whales and, and Turnigan Arm and Knick Arm and up by the poor shit down by Ship Creek. And, um, you know, they're usually, oh, there's a little white dot way out there. Well, here in Churchill, uh, you'll get 3,000 or more beluga whales swim up into the Churchill River uh, every summer. And, um, it gets to the point where um, people are out paddle boarding and these curious whales will come up, swim right up to them. Uh, if you want to see more images on this, you can go to my friend Erin's Instagram page. She's at sup underscore north. And she does, she actually has a paddleboard yoga business. Uh, and then the beluga whales often make appearances when they're out paddle boarding and <laughs> doing yoga. Which brings us to uh to polar bears, which is, uh, which is the reason we're here, right? And everybody wants to, wants to learn more about polar bears. Um, so polar bear season uh, in Churchill is generally considered uh, the months of October and November. Uh, anytime around uh, Halloween is, is generally considered a safe bet. Um, really, the bears come off the ice when there's about 30 to 50 percent ice coverage. So they'll start showing up in numbers in midsummer, we'll call it. Uh, July. Um, and then they're basically just biding their time until they, uh, until they can get back out on the sea ice. Um, now, Churchill, being a town that's right in the middle of the migratory path, um, they've had to figure out different ways to live with uh, polar bears, and ecotourism has played an important role in that. And so, if you think about 40 years ago, any bear that came near town was shot on site. Any base commander that was stationed here was going home with polar bear pelts. It was just the way things got done. Well, suddenly you have this ecotourism, well, not suddenly, but over several decades, you have this ecotourism industry uh, that comes up and people start clamoring for better conditions for the bears. They did things like close the dump. Uh, they stopped shooting them so much. Um, they actually have a polar bear alert program. Uh, that they have uh, staff here in town that their whole job is to uh, to keep tabs on pull. And there's a hotline if you're in Churchill and you dial 204-675-BEAR, it will get you the polar bear alert program. They will capture bears that are coming close to town, either in culvert traps or by darting them, and they'll put them in the whole polar bear holding facility, uh, which is uh, locally known as the polar bear jail. Officially, it's the polar bear holding facility. Um, inside, it is very jail-like, or what they tell me a jail would like be like. Uh, a lot of cinder blocks and metal bars, and they'll they'll hold them in there for about a month, uh, and then they'll actually airlift them out. Uh, here's a, a video of them airlifting a polar bear uh, out of town. So they'll they'll fly them out about forty kilometers and drop them off, uh, wait for them to wake up and get moving again, and then they fly home kind of thing. But this just goes to show uh, how the values of, or how people value polar bears has changed around here and direct response to the, the ecotourism. Um, so now it is, you know, it's expensive <laughs> to, to fire up helicopters and fly these, these bears around. Um, so now those bears are worth enough that you keep them alive. You fly in places, you do what all you can to keep them safe as opposed to just shooting them as a nuisance animal. Uh, <laughs> this was just the other day, actually. It reminded me of a little bit of a jailbreak situation. I went to show those folks the polar bear jail, and I'll be darned if there weren't polar bear tracks right outside the jail. <laughs> so it was just visiting, just visiting. Uh, 
So why are these polar bears here? So here we are back at our map of Hudson Bay. And so Churchill, again, is that little east-west shelf that's over on the left side or the west side of the map there. And you'll see that the currents in Hudson Bay are generally counterclockwise, right? Uh, we do get a lot of north wind associated with it as well. And so um, all the rivers, like the Churchill River is kind of right in that little nook right there. And then all the rivers going north start pumping out ice. And it gets brought down that western shoreline, Hudson Bay, uh, where it's northwest. Those currents bring it down the coast and it jams up on this east-west shoreline. So this really is the first place on Hudson Bay uh, where the ice will form in any significant way for these bears to get back out on the ice. And of course, these bears are just like polar bears in Alaska. They're marine mammals. They hunt seals. Um, their primary prey, if they had their choice, they wouldn't come on land. They'd spend all their time out on the sea ice. Um, so the ice-free period here uh, has been increasing. Um, it was over 150 days this year. Um, they've generally lost about seven weeks of ice time in the last 40 years. So here's a little graphic. Um, it's going to show you the ice where it's very fast. Uh, it's going to show you twice, but I, and I, I lost control of my cursor, so I can't point out Hudson Bay. But remember that east-west shoreline? So find Hudson Bay and then that little east-west shoreline in there and keep an eye on that and watch real fast as the ice forms. All right, it's over there on the left, you see it? Boom, there it is, it filled in. Then it'll melt off again, we'll watch it one more time. So this has been happening this way for a long time, the bears know this. And so as the temperature starts to cool, um, these bears start to jam up on the shoreline here, waiting for that ice to form so they can get, get back out. Now that provides us with a bunch of uh, fascinating opportunities to watch these bears. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of folks have uh, seen a lot of brown bears in the last, I know I've spent a lot of time watching brown bears and it is different watching brown bears. Uh, when you go to places like McNeil River, Katmai or things like that, you're watching the bears during their busy season. Uh, they're fishing, they're all business. Um, these bears that are waiting for the ice are bored out of their minds. <laughs> they are very bored. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, sleeping. There's a lot of wandering around. There's a lot of mischief. They're very much like bored teenagers. Uh, so we, we like to keep our distance. We know, we know how bored teenagers can be. Uh, but here's an example of a, a young sub-adult bear that it turns out, we did a little investigating after the fact, it was hunting bubbles. There were bubbles coming up out of this the little pond on the edge, and this polar bear was just enough to do some uh, hunting maneuvers on it. But it just shows the power and the strength of even just this is a small animal, um, just show how fast and how strong they can be. This little <laughs> this little guy was a fun one. Um, this is a big cub, a yearling cub. So going out on the ice for the, the second time, hanging out with mom. Um, and this, his mom, who we'll see here in a little bit, uh, was very experienced. She was a very cool customer. She uh, spent a lot of time, she'd been here in relatively the same place since the middle of summer. And they had this berry patch staked out. Um, it was right near this spot, actually. Um, and she'd nap a lot and the cub would go wander around, climb on the rocks and things like that. Um, we called this one blueberry butt because they did have this spot staked out and they could be found about every, every couple days uh, eating blueberries on the side of the road kind of thing. Here they are again. This was right as our first fall, first snow of the year was starting to fall. And everybody was really worried uh, this year because it was so warm, so late into the sea um, that it was potentially going to have negative effects uh, on ice freeze up. Um, last year, the ice froze, the bay froze on like, November 13th. Um, this year, I'm going to call it officially as today. <laughs> I bet there are a lot of bears out there today. There's enough ice and you'll actually, you'll see later in the, in the show, uh, I've got a picture of what the ice looks like uh, yesterday. I tried to go get you guys an ice picture from today, but I got stuck and then to turn around. Um, 
so really it's it's not that far off the schedule, but that owes to this big blizzard we had uh, just a few days ago. Um, here's a here's a fun one. Max was there for this one. Uh, this <laughs> this little bear was snacking on some bull kelp there on the shorelines, um, and they do eat here. You know, they're eating berries, uh, they're eating kelp, um, they're eating kind of anything that smells good to them. Uh, but it's not enough. It's not what they need. They need fat. They get fat from seals. Uh, there's no fat in kelp. There's no fat in, 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 there's no fat of a significant kind that would be enough to support a population of bears that can be found in any terrestrial ecosystem. So, you know, basically what they're doing here is they're biding their time, they're filling their stomachs, uh, but it doesn't have the right nutrition for, that, nutrition for them to be successful in the long term. Uh, they do a lot of climbing around on the rocks. Uh, this is another early season pick, um, waiting for the, we waited for hours for this bear to wake up and just walk across the rocks to get it just right with the light and things like that. So, um, yeah, so there is a lot of sitting around waiting for him to do stuff. It's not just constant action. Speaking of the shipwreck, it is fun to watch their, their uh, so this is the same shipwreck that we showed uh, the Aurora uh, earlier. Um, so just to let you know how big it is, there's a well, small, medium-sized polar bear there on the stern. And we watched this bear walk up and disappear into the boat. And it did a little exploring and then it climbed out. Um, <laughs> this is a fun little bear, but it's just soft. It's just cruising along the shoreline, following its nose, seeing what, uh, seeing what it can find. Here was the bear practicing its hunting techniques uh, <laughs> along the shoreline. Uh, it was actually pouncing on a, uh, a pile of kelp that uh, didn't make it. The kelp was <laughs> devoured. <laughs> Not all of it, of course, it was a big pile, but, uh, <laughs> but it was interesting to see this, this little bear practicing the, the seal hop, the pounce, to try and, uh, like it was trying to get into a seal layer or get a seal out from under the ice, uh, but it was really just this pile of kelp. Another one. So at low tide, you get all these fantastic rock fields and boulders that are exposed or that are underwater at high tide, and uh, and so as the tide drops out, it basically turns into a highway out there, uh, like that little bear that walks right out to the shipwreck. Um, same. This is just right along that same line. If I were to zoom a little bit higher, you'd be able to see the shipwreck uh, off in the distance there. Again, just cruising the highway. This mom and cub. Uh, and they were around a lot. We got a lot of good looks at, at these two. Um, she was another cool customer. Uh, you do have, uh, the bears here are generally very well uh, habituated. Um, they're not uh, um, running away from people generally, things like that. They're, they're fairly tolerant of, of human behavior as long as that human behavior falls in, into a range of behaviors that they find predictable. Uh, it's the same uh, repeated benign interaction ladybirds, habituated bears that we see with the brown bears and catmine or things like that. Um, so uh, polar bear viewing can be done uh, safely, if not, it's always done cautiously, uh, but it can be done safely. Oh, uh, here's a cute moment. I think this is the same mom and cub. Uh, and I think we just saw them again for the last time yesterday. I think I have another picture of them coming up here in the slideshow uh, as we get towards the end. Now there are about 20 kilometers of road uh, or of highway here in Churchill and it basically goes out to the end and then comes back to town. Um, so because you've got all these bears moving around, there is the, the potential to see bears just, uh, just walking along the side of the road. Uh, I think of it as kind of like uh, seeing a, a moose in Anchorage or, or something like that, but it's a polar bear. Um, here's one just strolling down the road one day. Uh, I do have a, the next series are, are all pictures I've taken from the car with my iPhone, because of course the, the best camera you have is the one that you have with you. Uh, oh, here's one. <laughs> uh, I did want to try and get this picture before my season started. Uh, this is taken through the backup camera on my truck. Uh, there was a Yellowstone style bear jam is that mom and blueberry butt would camp out along the side of the road and uh, we left the gap uh, behind us in case they wanted to cross and sure enough this is the cub uh, it's a giant cub uh, 
crossing <laughs> crossing over, but it stopped enough traffic that there was this bus and this camera crew over there. And the, uh, the cub was actually trying to go in between the bus and the camera. He did make it. He squeezed through there, but it was a, a tense situation there for a couple minutes as, as traffic was stopped. Now, this is just the other day out cruising around, uh, <laughs> looking in the rear view mirror. This little cub came up, or not little cub, sorry, this little bear came up and was uh, wandering around the vehicle. We don't uh, like to get let them uh, get too close to vehicles, so I did have to rev the engine a couple times and, and just keep that bear at a, at a distance um, just to maintain a uh, little bit of boundary uh, with this little guy. Another one, just cruising down the road. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of different workers. Uh, you see the truck with the headlights on there. That's the Manitoba, Manitoba Hydro truck. Um, they, uh, they're the utility company here. They provide power. And, uh, but they're always out looking for bears. <laughs> Anytime you see the Manitoba Hydro truck zipping down the road, you know they have a hot lead on, on where to find a polar bear. So, but they do natural stuff too. You know, it's not just the roads here this is um, Churchill is uh, kind of unique and, and it's got these exposed uh, rocks this is the Canadian shield is exposed and going out towards Hudson Bay and so it makes for some really excellent photo opportunities right uh, right near town here so uh, most of the how we do our bear viewing is we're driving around and pick up trucks um, uh, and then uh, some little Toyota forerunners, and we basically just drive around on on the the road and go down the the back roads and get into some places where uh, bears are frequently found. And then uh, we do have the opportunity to get out uh, if it is safe to get out uh, to get better pictures or lower angles and things like that. And then as a bear approach, we generally just hop back in the vehicle and uh, everybody goes away happy and healthy. Um, the location that we talked about being at the uh, where three major ecosystems come together provides for some uh, interesting uh, photo ops that you're not always going to see, uh, like photographing polar bears and trees uh, is something that's that's relatively unique to this part of Hudson Bay. Um, here, <laughs> two bears, it's actually a male, a big male and a female bear are sparring. Uh, and sparring is one of the behaviors that people come to Churchill specifically to see. Um, and you often hear it get, you know, they're sizing each other up for, you know, when they're out on the sea ice and they know not who not to mess with and things like that. And I don't, I don't necessarily uh, think that's what's going through their mind. I think they're just bored, really. You know, if you've, you've been coming back to the same place for your entire life and you've seen the same bears year after year after year, there's a certain level of predictability. There's a certain level of trust that forms. And so you see so-and-so and, uh, Hey, you want to wrestle? <laughs> it's basically how it starts. And these two, uh, they did a lot of wrestling this year. And then, and we've been watching these two for, for years, actually. Uh, I remember three or four years ago now, uh, it was really confusing because the sparring was not a behavior that people would tell you that females do. Um, but they do. They're bears. They do what they want. Don't tell them what to do. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, this is a male and a female polar bear that like to, uh, like to spar together. Uh, a couple of video clips, just this is, so this is pond ice. Um, this is how these, as the, the things are starting to freeze up and things are, are, are they're testing ice and things like that. Uh, I think I turn off the, yeah, okay. Um, so this is a mom and a cub uh, walking and check out how good she is at navigating this ice. You can see there's Hudson Bay out in the background. Uh, so that's obviously not frozen, but it's cold enough that the ponds are frozen and watch her spread out. So we'd probably fall through this, but Mama Polar Bear spreads her legs out super wide. Spread that weight out so she doesn't follow, fall through. The cub doesn't know what's going on. It's light enough. It can just walk through, no problem. <laughs> So I think this is this is a different cub. This is a little cub. Uh, 
practicing its seal hunting technique. They do love doing this. So if you see them out on the sea ice and they're hunting seals, that's how they do it. See me those layers of a breakthrough ice uh, using those powerful front limbs and things like that. Um, this little guy is probably not that powerful yet, uh, but he's getting there. He's getting there. He's sure, uh, sure in the hours so he can practice and, and get those seal. Um, right as the things are starting to, to freeze, we get a nice dusting of snow finally. Uh, and this was just taken uh, just outside by, out of, out of town by the airport, a little ways out. Um, and then here, this is a little further out. These are two big males having a discussion. Uh, so I was wondering if they're going to spar. And then that guy that's the bigger of the two that's got no ears, he was really just kind of a jerk. And he just wanted to push this other bear around. So there was no intention of sparring or anything like that. Um, this is a big old guy. He was around for several years. Uh, I don't know if they saw him this year. I didn't see him. But, uh, but yeah, he was a big, gnarly old dude. <laughs> I love getting these little glimpses into their, into their lives. So coming into the view there in the back, you've got the, the, the classic Churchill tundra buggy. Um, so there are, uh, that is another way to do polar bear viewing here around Churchill. Uh, and there, uh, there's the Churchill Wildlife Management Area that's way out uh, east of town. And they will go out in these giant uh, off-road vehicles, uh, low PSI tires, they stay on designated trails and things like that. Uh, so it's also an excellent way. And this is how most of the polar bear viewing gets done. Uh, so if you book a package tour or things like that, you'll go out in, in some of these, these big vehicles. Uh, and you generally, when you're doing that, you see a lot more polar bears than we see um, closer to town in smaller vehicles. A lot of that owes to the fact that you're 12 feet up in the air and you can see over willows and, and behind rocks and, and things like that. And they, they have a tendency towards covering more ground and seeing how many bears they can see. Um, closer to town, we try to do uh, more quality rather than quantity. Uh, we don't rush around and try to see every bear, uh, but we try to get more intimate glimpse into that bear's life. We might spend a whole day or a whole afternoon uh, just hanging out with a single bear um, just to see what it does and see if it provides some interesting photo opportunities. This was just the other day, that mom and, and, and cub and uh, she was super stoked to be able to get out on the ice. And she walked out, she started giving herself a snow bath and rolling around and the cub was checking out another bear that was walking around on the shore and thinking about going out. Uh, and then the last time, last I saw him, they were taking off, was just testing the ice. This is not quite as solid as it looks. She was having some problems. The cub was just walking right over it, but the mom was having a little trouble falling through and things like that. So, but today was cold and windy. And so hopefully it, it got that all packed in so she can get out and start, uh, start hunting for seals. Now, kind of the official end of polar bear season is when they release the last bears from polar bear jail. And this is how they do it. Uh, so if they, uh, they load them back up into culvert traps. Uh, so they'll pull the trucks into the jail, hook them to the walls, and then open the door. And those bears generally want to get out of that cell so bad they run right into the culvert trap. And they will take them out towards the sea ice. And this is actually this video is from a few years ago, but they did this today actually release bears. So they back them up to this wooden box and then uh, whoever the junior conservation officer is, jumps out and cranks that door open. And then, uh, and then here they go. This is, this is how they do it. I think the sound is on here. So you can see they, they pull away, they start honking their horns. Um, that polar bear comes flying out of that trap. You know, and it sees the sea ice and it knows what to do. 
We shoot off some cracker shells, honk some horns, blast some sirens. The whole thing is designed to be a little bit of a hazing experience, keep them wary of people. Uh, but that bear is released. Consider that the end of the season. And so the last pick I'd like to leave you with tonight is actually from yesterday. And this was uh, a smaller bear that it was making its way out, testing it a lot like that mom and the cub were doing the same thing. And it looked back to just take a little last whiff to see if anybody was following it. And it just walked off on this. And that's that. So um, I can't see any of the chat stuff. Uh, we're coming up, but it's been about 45 minutes, 40 minutes since we started talking. I wanted to leave some time for question and answer and, and things like that. So I hope there are some, uh, some good questions in there. Uh, we'll take a few minutes, get those all answered. And yeah, any good yeah, questions? That was, Rich? That, that was amazing, Drew. Uh, it's just astounding to think about where you are. You've got wild polar bears outside your door right now. Like that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Like, sure, in Anchorage, we've got the brown bears, you know, whatever. It's, polar bears are outside your door. It always takes some getting used to it. When you, when you see the first one and you're kind of, oh, okay, there, yep, polar bears. It's a real thing. <laughs> it's insane. That's insane. So I do have to give a shout out to the Alaska Zoo. Uh, we have a polar bear. Her name is Cranberry. And I hate, this is a big thing. Her birthday is tomorrow. Oh, really? Right? Right? And of course, she was born on Thanksgiving, thus the name Cranberry, B-A-R-Y. Uh, you see? All right. Anyway. I love it. If you're in Anchorage or if you're in Alaska, come see us. Come to the Alaska Zoo. Come say hi to Cranberry. She's amazing. She's about, I think uh, last I read, about 550 pounds. Uh, so she's a little on the smaller side for the polar bears, uh, from what I understand. But lots of questions coming in, Drew. Let me see what we can find here. Hold yeah, on. We just did 99 on the chat. Let's see here. What's the lifespan of a polar bear, Mr. Drew? Oh man, 18 to 20 in the wild. Uh, I know they've gone over 40 in zoos, uh, but it's a hard life out there. You know, I guess low twenties would not be, would not be unheard of. Um, but just if it's right, and they can last a long time out there. Um, somebody uh, writes in, when do the Cubs leave their mom? Uh, you know, this is actually, um, it's up to mom, really, in a lot of ways. Uh, but generally about two and a half years, uh, they'll spend with mom. In this part of the world, there can be uh, geographic variation in that. Um, you know, before my time, but traditionally, uh, I think this Western Hudson Bay population would tend to kick them out a little earlier than that. Um, but two and a half is, is what we've been seeing as of late. Um, let's see here from Donna. Are polar bears in your area similar to the size to the ones in Alaska? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I think so. Um, you know, I am just seeing a select, it's all opportunistic, anecdotal, you know, I'm not, uh, I just have the bears that I watch. Uh, I have watched uh, quite a few polar bears in Alaska too. I have heard some anecdotal evidence that the Alaska polar bears are taller. I think I got that one from uh, Stephen Amstrup. If you ever have a chance to hear him go talk, if he's ever coming through Anchorage or anything like that, be sure and uh, uh, be sure and check him out, uh, and then ask him. Like he, I think I'm just stealing his story here. So, uh, but I think the last couple polar bears he taller. Yeah, he is. Uh, is it true? I think he's kind of the world-renowned experts on polar bears, right? Is that and, and he comes through Anchorage, Anchorage with some regularity. So, do yeah. keep an eye out for him. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked, can you feed cranberry? Uh, <laughs> you, you could, but you might pull a binky. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, cranberry has a very awesome diet, but we leave that up to the experts who are the zookeepers. Uh, Zookeeper Beth, if you're watching, and Katie Hay out there. Um, but they take care of cranberry and definitely uh, feed her. Um, so somebody asks... Um, what happens if the ice disappears due to climate change and what happens to the polar bear? 
Uh, nothing good is really going to come of that. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about how they need that fat. And, you know, really, they could more accurately be described as lipivores than, than carnivores even. They need that fat. When, they, uh, when a healthy polar bear catches a seal out on the ice, it's going to strip the fat off first and process that directly into fat on its own body. Um, and if you start looking at um, people throw out all sorts of different uh theory oh they could adapt they could catch fish or they could eat caribou or they could eat goose eggs or whatever um, there's just not enough fat calorie there are not enough fat calories available for them to uh, maintain um, in any healthy population size um, so as you get longer and longer ice-free periods it's going to be of a detriment to the polar bears uh, you start looking at um, you know, the uh, female body mass of a population, like are they, once they reach a certain point, they just stop reproducing. And so uh, it is something that uh, they very closely monitor uh, when they look at population number. Um, just even a couple decades ago, uh, they were saying there were about 1200 bears in this, in this Western Hudson Bay population. Now it's down to, you know, mid 800s uh, probably. So numbers are declining, body mass uh, is declining things like that. So it's something that uh, is, is not going to go well for the polar bears when they don't have that sea ice. Um, how about this? Uh, have you ever seen a, a polar bear uh, have a successful hunt where you are? You know, uh, they, every year there are um, uh, usually a couple seals caught. <laughs> because I think it's because of the it, it's very shallow here and so the tide goes out and some seals will get stuck um there were at least two seal kills this year I did not actually see it happen but I got to see the aftermath which is always exciting uh, a few years ago we had a, a dead beluga whale wash up that caused all kinds of pandemonium with polar bears crawling all over it wolverines and wolves and all sorts of stuff wow. um, so I've never actually gotten to see them Kill so well, except for that little polar bear I showed you the video of. He got those bubbles uh, pretty good, uh, but uh, but no, it, it is fun to watch the the bear bear dynamics. You know, working at McNeil River, that was always fascinating to me. It was the time watching brown bears interact with one another, and polar bears are, are very similar. Uh, watching them interact, um, it's a bit more their their communication appears to be a bit more uh, subtle. Uh, they're quieter in many ways. Uh, there's a they're a bit more uh, fluid maybe in how they in how they do things uh but ultimately they all speak bare uh, they all understand each other wow i still can't believe you have bears outside your door right? <laughs> i um, hope they're not there right now they should be out on the ice hey <laughs> uh somebody asked um do they hunt alone generally yes um, family groups would be the exception. Uh, obviously the cubs are going to be with mom. That's how they learn the ropes. That's how they learn to be, be polar bears. Um, now they will potentially share sources like one, something's, but they're not, it's like, they're not collectively hunting. Like I'm going to help you, you help me kind of thing. Um, but there's a lot of documentation of bears, um, coexisting peacefully uh, over, you know, larger food sources or things like that, or even just coming to some sort of truce over a small food source. Um, it depends on the personalities of bears involved. And the more you watch bears, the more you realize how distinct every single one of their personalities. They're, they're just as distinct as all two of us in the meeting here, um, just as diverse. Um, if not more, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it just depends on how those personalities come together and if they can work out a way to, to share that without uh, destroying each other, then they can work it out. So I, I have a question. I've heard this story a lot uh, before I worked at the zoo. Is it true that like, I know some groups will, you know, eat polar bear. I've heard that the polar bear liver is like super toxic or something. What what is that? What's that story about? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, polar bear liver is very high in vitamin A, and it's got a it's got a they've got a mechanism for sequestering that in there that that we don't have. So, um, actually, when I was referring to some of the early Western explorers that came through here, um, it was not uncommon for them to perish from eating either undercooked polar bear meat, which uh, has a tendency towards having trichinosis. Or, uh, or eating the liver, uh, which was very tough.
talking vitamin A content. Wow. And is that because of their diet? Is that something they get from the seal oil or meat or? Well, considering, uh, you know, I don't know uh, officially, my answer is going to be, I don't know, but considering that's the vast majority of what they eat, it's gotta, <laughs> figure it's got to come from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody just wrote, uh, do baby bears, uh, learn how to swim or is it a natural kind of instinct? You know, there's gotta be a, a learning process to it. I'd imagine, um, you know, they've followed mom, things like that. Um, and they are pretty decent swimmers right out of the gate. Uh, I have watched a couple cubs, uh, swim. The problem with the cubs swimming is they don't have the fat and they don't have the fur. Uh, necessarily that their mother has. And so um, what we see is bears, it's been documented, having to swim further and further to get off the shore. And if they're having to swim hundreds of kilometers, if that's a mom, those cubs are not going to make it. Um, they don't have the, they don't have the, the physical prowess uh, to do it. So the, the longer these bears are going to need to swim uh, to get to a stable platform, um, you're going to see those cubs just not being able to do that. Uh, somebody asks, what, what's your favorite thing about a polar bear and how did you, how did you come to love them? Oh, uh, well, I think, I think Binky, I think Binky left such a major impression. Uh, you know, so I, I always, I still, when I'm in town, I love going to the zoo and, and watching all the kids, watching the bears, uh, you know, maybe chiming in a little anecdote here, here and there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think, I think watching them from an early age was what uh, endeared me to them. And then um, polar bears, I love how kind of quiet and sneaky they are. They, they've got a lot going, you know, you watch them and they're, they're definitely, they're thinkers, those wheels are all, uh, but they're just very quiet about it. They're very understated. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's how, how sneaky and smart they are. So I was just going to ask, like, you've worked a lot with brown bears. How are polar bears different? And maybe you just answered that. They, they're just a more sneaky critter than a brown bear? Well, they're quieter, uh, at least, you know, how I'm watching them, uh, is, is I just, again, I just have this limited, I just watch them when they're here on the shores of Hudson Bay and I've watched them uh, in Alaska when they're on shore waiting for the sea ice. Um, but there, there, is a, there is a certain subtlety uh, to polar bears that, that is kind of quiet and, and maybe zen-like or <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to hear. Everybody should just come watch some polar bears. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it and see what everybody else thinks. Um, but in terms of how they communicate with one another, um, it's maybe not necessarily as refined as, as, you know, going to Brooks or McNeil or someplace where, where those bears are forced to communicate a lot. Um, here, you know, the bears, when they're out on the ice, ski fairly solitary. Um, even when they're on land, we call it a congregation. It's not like they're all just stacked up right on top of one another. Um, there are places like you fly over Cape Churchill in the summertime and there'll be a dozen bears or something just laying there or more, um, just laying there all in relatively proximity but they're not necessarily having to uh interact or uh on, on the same level that that brown bears that are trying to share a food source uh, would have to interact um they're also uh they're harder to tell apart you know for anybody that's been to mcneil or been to books and you're like oh that's bear so-and-so or that's luther or that's whatever um the the sets of pressures that made polar bears polar bears uh mean they're very specific um, they don't have a lot of the same uh, variation that you like. Head shape has to be pretty polar berry. They have to have long necks. They have to have robust curved claws. They have to have large nasal cavities for warming the air before it goes into their lungs. They have to be white. Um, otherwise, they die. Uh, so because of that, it can be harder to tell them apart. Uh, but there are a number of bears where we're able to identify on site whether they have unique characteristics uh, behaviorally, whether they have scars or whatever. There are just certain things you can tell. Uh, you can tell a bear. I mean, one ear, ear is a different, I don't know, they're, they're things. Uh, so it is, it is fascinating to try and uh, it's very challenging to track them through time, but it's always very rewarding when you do. 
Um, all right, we've got probably time for just one more. Um, somebody asked a, a good question here. Um, how did the, uh, do the hollow hairs and polar bears fur develop as they mature or do they have those specialized hair at birth? Hmm. That's an excellent question. You know, I'm not exactly sure. I think they grow in, uh, but that might be somebody at the zoo might be able to answer that one. Yeah, I was just thinking that that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I would guess that baby fur is different than an adult male or an adult female. So, I mean, just like baby hair on a person changes over time. I'm assuming it's since they're a mammal, it's probably seven. I don't know. I still have my baby hair. That's right. I was going to comment on your baby hair. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I, 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 if I were betting, I would say that it was, uh, it comes in th through time. Um, but I'm not going to bet a lot. Uh, no, it's, it's a good bet though. Um, awesome. Oh my gosh. So I do want to say, uh, uh, I drew a name at random during the presentation and Donna. Did you say Drew? Uh, no, not Drew. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Not this time, Drew. Uh, Donna, uh, Housden, Donna Housden, uh, we will email you probably tomorrow and get your information where you can pick up your gift bag. Um, and it's a mystery. I don't even know what's in it, but thanks to Alaska Geographic um, for donating that. So um, I also want to say just really quick again, um, our partners to bring this whole program to you, um, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, of course, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, the National Park Service, Alaska Conservation Foundation, Projects in Motion, and Alaska Geographic. So thank you to all of those folks to bring us here tonight and of course uh thanks to mr drew hamilton uh and all of your polar bear awesomeness well thank you rich it's, uh like i said it's always a pleasure it's good to see you even if it is uh 